ברוך אתה ה' אלוהינו מלך העולם, אשר קידשנו במצוותיו וציוונו לעסוק בדברי תורה. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandment and has commanded us to be engaged with the words of Torah. O Lord our God, we ask that you make the words of your Torah sweet in our mouth and in the mouth of the entire people of the greater house of Israel. May we, our descendants and the descendants of your people of the greater house of Israel, know your name and study your Torah for its own sake. Blessed are you, O Lord, who teaches Torah to these people. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who chose us from all peoples to give us his Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah. So, we're still in the story of Moses, Egypt, and all that, with their plagues and bugs. And uh, which leads us to the story of, okay, I remember there was an, an announcement I was supposed to make. I wrote my note. If I would only go up to my notes, it would be fine, I have no problems. Anyway, so, you know, this week we're going to, uh, uh, they're playing The Chosen. Uh, episode seven and eight at the movies. I think it's in Sandy Cinema. So uh, some of us are going on Thursday. So if you want to be part of this, some of us gotta buy your tickets. You know. So you got. You got I, I don't have all the information. Uh, I think. D has more information because they, actually D and Ernest already have their tickets to go. I'm gonna go and get my tickets. But if you want to know if you want to ask her, I can ask her the timing and blah blah blah. And she'll tell you. But I uh, just wanted to uh, mention that. I think it's exciting. Okay, so we're on our power shop boat. Deliverance from slavery, which, and this parsha introduces us to the story of Passover. The story of Passover. Very soon, we will be celebrating the Passover, and at that time, we'll be telling the story of the Exodus. It's in this year. It's in early April. Early April. And uh, it's a good story. The story of the Exodus is a good story. And as I said before, even though the narrative of this story is about the children of Israel 3,400 years ago, it is also our story. It's a story of the congregation and like a shared last time, it is also our story personally, personal story. How do I know? Because, as Paul said, all these things took place as prefigurative historical events warning us not to set our hearts on evil things as they did. These things happened to them as prefigurative historical events, and they were written down as a warning to us who are living in the Achalita Yamin at the end of time. And if it was applicable to Corinth 2,000 years ago, it's all the more applicable to us today. Gonna know this verses by heart soon. I've been harping on the but we are not yet at the time to celebrate Passover. Our next celebration is to be Shvat on the 15th of Shvat. To be Shvat means 15th of Shvat. That's what it means, it's a date. And this year it's on the 6th of February. It's the new year of the trees. 
So if you're not familiar with it, you can refer to the ebook that came to in the recent Yad a bit. So the one thing that I'm not going to go about about it because you're going to read the book, or maybe you already read it. You know, but the one thing I can tell you about it is that one of the traditions is to plant a tree. It's to plant a tree in that day. So, but I digress. Uh, let's go back to our Exodus story. As we read this story in our parsha this week, we participate in a Passover <laughs> seder. Sorry, I got to see the next one. Okay, Passover it's not really well written. So. And one of the texts of the Haggadah, it's over there, it's in Hebrew and transliteration, and a little bit in English. One of the texts of the Haggadah Shem, Pesach, Passover, the Haggadah is a book that we use to do the Seder, is, it says, we were slaves in Egypt, and the Lord freed us from Egypt with a mighty hand. That's what it reads. So when we do the celebration of the sinner, and we say we were slaves. In Hebrew, it's Ainu Avadim. We were slaves. We read that at the Passover Seder. Some of it, the story is also part of the liturgy of many uh, uh, festivals. The story of the Passover is is reminded every time there is a festival there is something about it that's mentioned you know so it, 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 it's the story you know so and it is so because it is important to remember it you know the lord who freed us from egypt when when he gave the commandment he says i'm the lord who freed you from egypt it's like Every Saturday we'll read it, we'll remember it. Every Saturday, you know. And the reason why it's important to remember that story, it's a little bit like someone famous who said, those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Yesterday I was watching an article about, I was reading an article about Yom HaShoah, the Holocaust Memorial Day. And people are concerned that little by little, there isn't going to be anybody alive. You know, people get old to remember it. Once nobody's alive, all we have is circumstantial evidence. Already while people were alive, you know, like when they, the Americans went to the camps, one of the generals told his officers, take as many pictures as we can, as you can, because one day there's going to be, a, and I quote, bleep, 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 that's going to say it never happened. While people are alive, people deny that it happened. So all the more, once all of them are passed away, people are going to say it never happened. You know, so, well, we have to remember and those traditions like the Passover, like the reading of the text, reading of the Bible, help us remember this. We were freed out of Egypt. He is the God who frees us out of Egypt. And that's valid in every generation. So, writing this text today got me thinking. I, I do that sometimes. You know, this past week, I've been telling this story, we've been, we've been talking about this story of the Exodus, uh, making sure that we don't forget that Israel at that time had assimilated a lot with Egyptian culture. It's important to remember that, that fact. If not, we don't remember the whole story. 
they actually loved it in Egypt. You know, so what did Hashem have to do? He had to make it uncomfortable for them, for them in Egypt, so that they want to leave. This is a very important part of the story, and we talked about that. Well, in the first half of the 20th century, Jews were very comfortable in Europe. Uh, they had, there had been a little bout of anti-Semitism at the end of the 19th century with the Dreyfus Affair. But all in all, Jews are very assimilated in Europe. At that time of the first half of the 20th century, Theodor Herzl had already created the Zionist movement. He did that at the end of the 19th century. At that time also of the first half of the 20th century, Chaim Weissman had secured the area of Palestine for the Jewish people through the Balfour Treaty at the end, in 1917, at the end of World War I. But nobody wanted to go to Israel. There was hardly anything there, you know. Nobody wanted to go, why? We're comfortable in Europe, come on. You know, anti-Semitism, ah, we'll deal with it, it's in the past. Actually, Germany at that time, in the uh, first half of the uh, 20th century, had become the seat of Jewish enlightenment. Where, uh, and, and the word is enlightenment, but what it was is this type of enlightenment was, ah, we don't, you know, this form of traditional Judaism is archaic and everything. We're modern Jews. You know, it had become the seat of, let's say, the modern modern Judaism called today Reform Judaism. So, actually, there was so much, there, there, there so much, Judaism was so much assimilated to German culture that they created a language. A language uh, was born from it. A language that is a mix between Hebrew and German. It's called Yiddish. Yid means Jew. Yiddish. Jew language. <laughs> That's what it means. Yiddish. You know, the tongue of the Jews of Eastern Europe. <laughs> you know, so, but then, uh oh. <clears throat> A new chancellor rose who knew not Joseph. A chancellor rose who knew not Joseph. He came to power, and you know the rest of the story. You know, so this story of the Passover is celebrated every year at Passover. It's read with the parsha every year. And we talk about it every Shabbat, and we talk about it every festival, you know. And I think whereas it is good to talk about it in the way of remembering that, that prayer I read from Jonathan Sachs, uh, to, to remember what man can do to man and be aware of our humanity or lack thereof, it's also a story about the dangers of assimilation. And I know I've talked a lot about this. You know, the dangers of assimilation. Some people who deal with Israeli immigration, Zionism is the idea that all Jews need to be in Israel. You know, and head Zionist people, head Zionist organizations, they complain that American and European Jews are comfortable in, in Europe, and especially American Jews, comfortable in America. There was, for a long time, there was more Jews in America than in Israel. Now I think it's about equal, you know. So because of the comfort, they don't immigrate. Like a few years ago, uh, there was an attack in a town called Toulouse in France, in a synagogue or school, and uh, 
And at that time, the right wing party of Israel, France was really growing. And during that period, France became one of the countries that had the most immigrants to Israel, most Jews immigrated to Israel because they just worked that up. There's a city north of Tel Aviv by the Mediterranean Sea called Netanya. They call it the Little France because all many French residents are there. But anyway, uh, it takes this discomfort in order for Jews to say, well, maybe let's go. Let's go. Uh, so, so, whereas they don't want to leave the comfort, let's say, of America, and let's say America because we're in America, they also complain of the rise of anti-Semitism, which is rising in America, in Europe, um, many places. It is the, the, those ideas are become becoming more to the fore. Some people that say that they had never dreamed to see uh, that day. The, to see the day they would, need, they, they would need to be concerned about being Jewish. Never in America. We should be, we should certainly be appalled to see things like this, but not surprised. Not surprised. You know? You know, in the days of the Romans, when the Rome really turned against Israel uh, in the second start as the start of the second century, early first century, second century, there was a real at that time because of the work of the disciples who had obeyed Yeshua to go into all the world. There were a lot of non-Jewish people who had who were following the God of Israel. They were the early Messianic Jews from the Gentiles. You know, and at that time, there was something called, uh, that a Roman emperor did called Fiscus Judaicus. It means Jewish tax. You pay the tax because you were Jewish. I think it was two talents and it was an enormous sum to pay just because you were Jewish. So that if a Gentile associated with Judaism by living like a Jew, doing Shabbat, uh, eating kosher, going to synagogue, reading the Old Testament and all that stuff, <clears throat> Romans, they didn't care about theology. If you're quite like a Jew, you're a Jew. Pay the tax. You know? But then those people who are actually not biologically Jewish say, wait a minute, I'm not Jewish. I don't have to pay the tax. I shouldn't have to pay the tax. This is Fiscus Judaicus. So at that time, those non-Jewish disciples were faced with a dilemma. Were they going to do like Moshe, who was a Jew, forsake the sins and pleasures of Egypt in order to go to the mud pits to make bricks with the Jews? You know, to take them. Or would say, oh, you know, I, I'm not really Jewish, so I don't. And this idea of not wanting to be, wanting Yeshua because we believe in the theology, but not only to be associated with Judaism and the Jews, is what actually started that separation. It was the beginning of the Gentile believers starting to want to live differently, worship on a different day, eat differently, and it, that started, you know. And I'm sharing that because I do believe those times are might be coming back if they don't go to Hashem. If they do, I 
think this question will rise again. You know, I think this question will rise again. So I think it it's important. So uh, I don't know why I'm out. Uh, why I'm I don't think you're anywhere there. Okay. <laughs> so yes. So uh, yeah. So. So we should not be appalled. We should not be surprised to see things like this, like on the on the slide. It has been a repeating story from the times of the Exodus. Yes, it is a story of man's bigotry, of man's inhumanity to man. But this is also a story that is a testament to man's inability to yield to Hashem's will. It is a story of man's reluctance to obey Hashem, of man's reluctance to submit and yield to God. It is the story of man's addiction to its own way, to his pride. It is a story of man's rebellion and resistance to Hashem. So that Hashem has to allow a situation to happen that makes us do God's will. We, we need to remember that. We need to remember that. Children of Israel would have never left Egypt if we had been comfortable. They would have never realized, obeyed the promise of Jacob, don't stay here, of Joseph, don't stay here. Say, oh, it's nice here, we'll visit Israel once in a while, we'll go visit the well of Abraham. You know. But uh, they would have never left. So, and I think it's, it's important. It's important. So, uh, it is the story of the three C's we did last week. Compromise, chastisement, come away, come offense. And again, Paul said that these things were written for us. Okay, it's good to read the stories, ah, the story of the Jews and the Exodus and Pharaoh, but if we don't apply it to our life today, you know, you know, yeah, actually somebody came to me, and I won't say who, uh, last week, and to me, you know, you know what you do to me? You made me read my whole Bible thinking, how does it apply to me now? I used to read it as stories. I said, good. <laughs> That's the point. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Check. <laughs> so, uh, so they were written for us. So how do we today, as the end of the age congregation, and we've talked a lot of application, about a lot of applications, right? So, but how do we, as the greater Israel body of Messiah, and I use the term greater Israel because it's a term that Paul used. I think it's in Ephesians, he talks about the greater Israel, the greater commonwealth of Israel, that's the Israel of Jewish Gentiles. You know, it's a greater Israel. The Israel of Jewish Gentiles. How do we as a greater Israel body of Messiah composed of both Jewish Gentiles? How do we today use the stories that was written for us to lead and guide our lives? How do we apply it? What does it mean for us today? How do we apply it to ourselves today? How whether whether as a 21st century Jew or Gentile disciple of the Jewish Messiah, how do we say at the Passover Seder, we were slaves in Egypt in all sincerity and truth? We have to, you know, it's like, I like traditions, but traditions still have got to be meaningful. You know, we got to say these things and mean them. It's got to mean something for us, you know. So, so uh, I like how Daniel Lancaster puts it in this week's Torah club. He tells a story by Rabbi Abraham Tversky. And here, there's a, I, have this, I have this picture here. And the story goes this way. And uh, Daniel says, in his book on the Passover Haggadah, a book called From Bondage to Freedom, 
Rabbi Abraham Tversky tells the story of a young man who, after a long struggle with chemical abuse, went through a rehabilitation program. He returned to his family for Passover. Sitting at his father's cedar table, he listened to his father tell the Exodus story. When his father reached the point where the Passover Haggadah says, we were slaves to Pharaoh, the young man interrupted the conversation. He interrupted the Seder. He asked the question. Hey, that's what happens at the Seder, right? Kids ask questions. So he said he interrupted the conversation and he asked, Father, when were you ever a slave? You know, his father was saying that and he challenged him. Says, you say that, but when were you ever a slave? And then he says, I can relate to being a slave. I was a slave to drugs, and there has never been so demanding and inconsiderate a taskmaster. So absolute an enslavement as addiction to chemicals. I had no choice whether to use them or not. I did things in my addiction I swore I would never do because a slave does as he is told. I only use, I not only use drugs when I like them and wanted to, I use them when I hated them. If I was ever a slave in the world, it was me. If there was ever a slave in the world, it was me. I know what it means to be a slave. And I know what it means to be free. This is quite a, an application. And then later on in the talk, Club Daniel offers the following application to the story. He says, all human beings are drug addicts. The drug to which we are addicted is selfishness and sin, ego. We are slaves to our egos, continually driven by the whip of our own evil inclination. We all need redemption and freedom. So, if we're going to apply this story to ourselves, and I know I've talked a lot about it, if we're going to apply this story to ourselves in the 21st century, first we must identify the compromises with our 21st century Egypt. We must identify these things. And once we have identified our compromises, we need to identify Pharaoh. You know, that's how we, we say, I was a slave in Egypt. And you remember slavery was the result of my compromise because God would not have done that if I would have left Egypt. You know, so we need to identify our compromises, we need to identify Pharaoh, not government Pharaoh, not government Pharaoh. We need to identify Pharaoh within, Pharaoh within us. The Pharaoh of our own evil inclination that push, pushes us to do, as Paul very well puts it, and I'm going to put a verse, is that a verse? Okay, I did that. Okay. So, I uh, hope you can see it. It's Romans 7, from Romans 7. But as you read it with me, I want you to pay attention to something. The word Torah is used a lot. Is used a lot in this passage. But sometimes it is written with a capital T. And sometimes with a small T. You know. In Hebrew, the word Torah, small t, the word Torah means instruction. You know, the, the King Solomon says, listen to the Torah of your mother. Listen to the instruction of your mother. When you get instruction for something, it's a book of Torah. You know, it's a very simple word, very uh, common word. But when you say Torah, capital T, that's God's Torah. Just like God's small g is used. God with G, that's God. You know? Same thing. So, so the difference in the text is made by, by the capital letter. So 
Paul says, as for me, I am bound to the old nature, sold to sin as a slave. That sounds a bit like what Daniel was saying. Sold to sin as a slave. And if you're a Jew, you say the word slave, Egypt. It's like, you know, so as for me, I'm bound to the old nature, sold to sin as a slave. Now, Paul is going to do a self-analysis of it. He does his own psychoanalysis. I don't understand my own behavior. I don't do what I want to do. Instead, I do the very thing I hate. Doesn't that sound like that guy we were reading about before? You know? Uh, now, if I am doing what I don't want to do, I am agreeing that the Torah is good. Torah capital T. You know, I, I'm... I'm proud of the Torah says to be humble. Oh, what are we it's like, I'm agreeing that the Torah is good. But it is no longer the real me doing it. But the sin, you know, the sin housed inside of me. For I know that there is nothing good housed inside me. That is, inside my own nature. Now, he discovered his own inner Pharaoh. I can want what is good, but I can't do it. Who can relate? We want to be meek and humble. We want to be kind and generous. We want to be forgiving, not taking revenge. While all the while adhering to a proper sense of justice, but we can't do it. We don't know how to do it. It is not our natural tendency. You know, there's a word you never have to teach a child. It's the word no. You know, you have to teach him, but you have to teach him to agree with you. You don't have to teach a child to take, to grab. That's natural. But you have to teach him to give and share. So, Paul ref continues reflecting. For I don't do the good I want. Instead, the evil I don't want is what I do. Uh -huh. But if I'm doing what the real me doesn't want, it is no longer the real me, but it is the sin housed inside me. Pharaoh. He's repeating himself to himself. That's the privilege of teachers and lives. <laughs> and he continues. So I find it to be the rule, a kind of perverse Torah, small t, that although I want to do what is good, evil is right there with me. But for for in my inner self, in my inner self, I completely agree with God's Torah capital T. But in my various parts, I see a different Torah's whole T. One that battles with the Torah big T in my mind and makes me a prisoner of sin's Torah small T, which is operating in my various parts. We so much want to do the right thing, to be nice, gentle, altruistic, but we find ourselves to be our own worst enemy. Paul continues his own self-analysis. He says, what a miserable creature I am. I wonder if you went to see a psychologist and talked to him like this, what the psychologist would say. <laughs> what a miserable creature I am. Isn't, isn't that the way we feel sometimes? If we don't feel that way, it's a problem. We should feel that we're not totally okay. So, and then he says, who will rescue me from this body bound for death? Who will deliver us from this evil pharaoh of our evil inclination? And then he gives the answer to his own question that he knows. He says, thanks be to God, he will, through Yeshua, the Messiah, our Lord. God frees us through Yeshua. 
Yeshua, the Redeemer, not come to Moshe. Right? Paul this concludes his own psychoanalysis with, to sum up, with my mind, I'm a slave of God's store, capital T, but with my own nature, I'm a slave to sin's Torah, small t. So, to answer the question that I was asking before, when I asked, as the greater Israel body of Messiah composed of both Jews and Gentiles, how do we today use the story of the Passover that was written to lead and guide our lives? What does it mean for us today? How do we apply it uh, to ourselves today? Whether as a 21st century Jew or Gentile, how do we say as a Passover Seder, we were slaves in Egypt in all honesty, sincerity, and truth? First of all, like I said, we, need, we must identify Pharaoh in our lives. How do we do that? James, the half-brother of Yeshua, uses a Talmudic understanding of the Torah as a mirror. You know, the, the Torah and the Talmud is compared to a mirror. Why? James uses that Talmudic comparison and he says, don't deceive yourselves by only hearing what the word says, but do it. For whoever hears the word but doesn't do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror, who looks at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But a person, but if a person looks closely into the perfect Torah, capital T, which gives freedom and continues becoming not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work it requires, then he'll be blessed in what he does. So what what this says is that when we look in the Torah, when we study the Torah, when we read the story, when we read Song. When we read the Torah, when we read the text, and when we read the stuff it's trying to teach us, right? When we read that, it's like looking into a mirror. And mirror, mirrors have the annoying propensity to tell the truth. They show it exactly like it is. They don't change anything. Mirrors can be very annoying. So, so, reading the Torah, so we, we, we learn from the Torah, the things we're supposed to learn, and then we look, at, it's like looking in a mirror, and as we read the Torah, it's supposed to show there's little imperfections here, or this here, and then maybe we put some color or something in to do, yeah, God. You know, it, it shows the imperfections. You know, it shows uh, the egg on the face, the booger on the nose, you know, the proud look, the angry countenance, the sulking attitude, the complaining glance. It shows that. And so, because we see it as what it is, because we know the Torah tells us we shouldn't be that way. Does that make sense? You know, you know, it's talk about continents. The Antichrist is described as the one with a proud continents. So, so basically. When we look into the mirror of the Torah, we see our own imperfection. You know, so, and then we have a choice to say, ah, it's okay. It's okay to have egg in the face. You know, actually, look pretty, a little bit of color. You know, maybe, maybe I'll just keep it and make a new trend. Egg on the face look, you know, it's great. 
you know, the egg on the face, the, you know, you can rationalize everything. So, but, uh, so it's not enough to see it. What we've got to do is do something about it. Go clean up. You know, it doesn't help if when we see these imperfections in the mirror of the Torah, we don't act upon it to clean up the egg on our face or the bugger on the nose, but instead decide to leave it there through rationalization. You know, so th that's important. He says, whosoever hears the word but doesn't do what he says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror, who looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what he looks like. The mirror of Torah reveals Pharaoh in us. When we study the Torah, we see our own imperfection. It says, don't desire, don't do revenge. It says, you know? And uh, we see our own imperfection. And then we got to work on it. And that's the different program. But the first idea is to identify. Once we've identified, we've accepted, oh, I've got this egg on my face. Oh my gosh, it looks horrible. You know, then we say, okay, I've got to go clean it up. And you've got to do what's necessary. And what's necessary for each one to clean their own egg on their own face might be different. You know, so the mirror of the Torah exposes the old nature, the common man, the Pharaoh that makes us act the way he wants instead of the way we know we should act. So James warned, if a person looks closely in the perfect Torah, which gives freedom, freedom from slavery, sin, and continues becoming not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work it requires, then he'll be blessed in what he does. You know, the book of James almost uh, didn't make a cut in, in being in a uh, in uh, the Brit, because James says, uh, faith without works is dead. He was preaching that to have faith in God without practicing, practicing the Torah is dead. That's what it means. The works he's talking about as a first century Jew is faith without practicing the Torah is dead. And, and the people who wrote it, who put the New Testament together said, no, 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 we don't want that. It almost, I read the story, but it almost didn't make a cut because of it. They, they were teaching, they felt James was antithesis to Paul, who so called preached against practice and told that he was not. You know, so it's, it's a, there's a lot about that. Anyway, but I'm not going to go down that trail. Uh, so then, so what it says is, he who acts on what he sees in himself through the mirror of the Torah will be blessed. You know, and blessed doesn't necessarily, blessing is of God and not necessarily counting in dollars and cents. You know, blessed with peace in our lives. You know, so <clears throat> it is then up to us to study the word in order to expose our own Pharaoh our own compromises, our own Egypt, and all that good stuff. Paul tells the Corinthians, here's where to go. Yeah. The Corinthians, so the story from the Corinthians in Corinthians 5 is about uh, There was a guy in the congregation, and you can read it from the beginning of the chapter, that who, the way Paul puts it is that he, he was intimate with his wife's, with his father's wife. It doesn't say his mother. Maybe it was his second wife, maybe something. I don't know. Something that Reuben did to Jacob. And uh, Paul says that that person should have never been allowed to be a brother in the congregation. But then, but, but what he was blaming, what he was after in 1 Corinthians 5 was not so much 
about some there was somebody who did something behind the sin. But what he was after, he was after the congregation who did not deal with him, who accepted the behavior. And he says, and he said, and you boast of it. They were even boasting of their situation that they were so proud of their own liberties. You know, we don't go up to this. You know, you know, we just got this little sidur, and we have an advertisement on it. And this morning I saw somebody, because uh, you wrote an, uh, Audrey wrote an ad. It was on Facebook, I think the Facebook, uh, love it about Facebook. And somebody wrote an answer and said, are we in the 21st, 2023 still following these archaic rules? It's archaic things. It's like, <laughs> So the Corinthians, they were proud of their liberty, of their, we, we, we're not like these people who are so religious, you know, we're, we're the law, we're enlightened. Mm -hmm. that's, what you, that, that, that's what he was after. So he says, he tells, uh, the, when he talks about the old leaven, he talks about unrepentant sin. Sin, you know, we all have. But when we rationalize the egg on the face and say it looks nice, it's actually better than everybody else who start trend, then that's the Hametz is talking about, the leaven product, leaven is sin. He says, get rid of the old Hametz. It's a Passover language. We do that before Passover. So that you can be a new batch of dough, because in reality, you are unleavened. For our Pesach lamb, the Messiah has been sacrificed. So let us celebrate the Seder not with leftover chametz, the chametz of wickedness and evil, disobedience to Torah, but with the matzah of purity and truth. We have to get rid of that Egypt, this ra rationalization of sin. So I want to end this midrash with actually uh, <clears throat> a text where Daniel Lancaster Midrashes the time transcendent cosmic understanding of the story of the Exodus, the first Passover, which is the, he does it with a climactic narrative that encapsulates everything we have studied for, from the chronicles of creation to such a time as the kingdom of Hashem is established on earth. He makes a text where the story encapsulates everything. It's the background of every story. And here's how he puts it. This is not from me, this is from Daniel Lancaster. I really liked it. That's what I'm reading. He says, the Torah binds up the identity of the nation of Israel with the story of the redemption from Egypt. It runs through the entire Bible King, I'm okay there, right? Yeah. King Solomon said, King Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 1 9, that which has been is what will be. And that which has been done is that which will be done. That's a prophetic statement. So <clears throat> the Bible begins with the story of humanity's exile from Eden. Adam and Eve were driven from paradise. They didn't compromise with a little character. You know? <laughs> they descended into the narrow world of concealment. The word Mitzrayim in Hebrew means narrow place. They descended into the narrow world of concealment, just like the sons of Israel descending from Canaan to, so to sojourn in Egypt. In the drama's final act, humanity will find its way back to Eden in the world to come. The story of the Exodus from Egypt was obviously prefigured in the story of Abraham's trip to Egypt, a trip where Pharaoh adopted, adop, abducted his beloved wife, Sarah. Then God spoke Pharaoh with flames. Sarah was relieved, and Abraham went up out of Egypt with great possessions. 
We encounter the story again as Jacob goes into exile, falling under the servitude of Laban. Laban, like Pharaoh, refused to let Jacob return to Canaan and he claimed everything Jacob owned as his. When Jacob finally left, Laban pursued him. God had to intercept Laban to rescue Jacob's family. If you remember, God gave a dream to Laban to leave Jacob alone. Jacob then returned to Canaan with great possessions. The story occurred again with Joseph going into Egypt as a slave, a forerunner of the bondage that was destined to be for the children of Israel in Egypt. God rescued Joseph from an imprisonment in the dungeon and exalted him to a great salvation. The prophets built on the same theme predicting a future day when God still redeemed, redeemed his people from exile among the nations as he once redeemed them from Egypt. Jeremiah said that in the future, people will no longer say, as the Lord lives, who brought up the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but instead they will say, who brought the sons of Israel from the nations where he had banished them. It will be the new saying, that's in Jeremiah 16. The same thing finds expression in the New Testament. The apostles identify Yeshua as the Messiah, the Redeemer of Israel, who will gather the exiles and bring the final redemption. He paid the price to redeem human beings from bondage to the kingdom of darkness. Yeshua offered his disciples freedom from darkness. And we read about the darkness in the plays this week too. The darkness said, uh, the English expression is, it was so thick you could cut it with a knife. No. If it was so dark, the, some people say it was so dark, even a candle wouldn't make a difference. No. But not in Israel, not in Goshen, only in Egypt. So Yeshua offered his disciples freedom from darkness, Satan's power, enslavement to sin, <laughs> and the fear of death. So, Abba Father, we thank you uh, that we can study this story. We thank you that we can learn to look at it uh, with personal eyes, not as a story belonging to people in another generation, the story belonging to us as our story, our story of compromise, our story of enslavement, our story with our Pharaoh, and our own story of deliverance. We ask that uh, you help us always remember this story and say to compromise, and say to enslavement as a result of compromise, never again. Help us to continue uh, faithfully uh, identifying Pharaoh and compromise by faithfully studying the words that you left us in the Torah through the teachings of Yeshua and the disciples. Yeshua Mashiach, Amen.